All right, so I'm going to change it up from the other segments, I think, and Josh and Matt did a wonderful job, but I, I know we also went a little long on those segments, and this is an album, it's the third Kinks album we're covering, it's actually wedged directly in between the two previous albums. Uh, the first album we covered was Something Else or Something Else by the Kinks, that preceded this album, and then uh, we also have covered Arthur and the Rise and Fall uh a rise and decline of the uh, Western Empire that follows this and is the second concept album. So this is wedged directly in between it. I'm going to give just a little bit of context on this and strongly urge you to revisit, especially the Something Else album by the Kinks, which was one of our earliest shows. Um, it might have been the first show. I know I said that earlier, but I do believe in this case something else. We covered that on the very first episode of Combing the Stacks. Uh, I gave a pretty long bio on the kinks there that I'll touch a tiny bit on when it's relevant um, and then covered the end of the kinks run um, a couple episodes again when we did Arthur. Um, so I'll kind of skip over some of that. Second episode, John, we talked about it's Second, kinks. man. For Same whatever reason, Leonard I keep thinking Cohen. that second. Something, not, yeah. th and it was, that wasn't something else. Yes, it yeah. was. That was face to face. Oh, it was face to face. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yep. I'm sorry. So we've covered four Kinks albums, haven't we? Face to face, something else, and um, Arthur. And Arthur. Arthur. Yes, I and apologize. That. Yep. King, so it was yeah, face to face. King, something else by the Kinks was on episode 15. Well, this is why I wasn't going to go long on the bio. So I just, <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm, I'm Leonard Cohen and Bob Dylan out, and I kind of want to get to talking about this album. Um, this is the sixth studio album by the Kinks. It was released in November 1968 uh, in the bummer category. It was actually released on the exact same day as the White Album. So, oh, um, oh, so yeah. it had a little bit of competition. Interestingly enough. Um, this album is often um, compared to Sgt. Pepper by the Beatles in terms of as a artistic statement by the Kinks. So um, even though this came out at the same time as the White Album, it was compared to a little bit of an earlier Beatles album. Uh, it was actually the last album recorded by the original band lineup of Ray Davies, Dave Davies, Pete Quaif, and Mick Avery. Uh, Quaif leaves the band in early 1969, which was a pretty funny story that I told in a previous episode. He basically, <laughs> he'd quit before, he quits later, but they don't really take him seriously <laughs> until he's in NME uh, introducing his brand new band and the new tracks that they're going to be uh, releasing. And that was when the band realized, oh, shit, I think he's really, you know, going to be <laughs> leaving. So um, there's a lot of good stories like that. Uh, this is also during that period where the Kinks are completely and totally fried. They toured in 1968 and by all accounts, just absolutely despised everything about touring. Um, they were kind of tired of playing their earlier stuff. They were at a little bit of a commercial decline at this point as well. And um, Ray Davies has said on many occasions that he was just feeling completely burnt out. Uh, and that kind of goes into the headspace he was in when he wrote this album as well as Arthur because he's in a place of sort of nostalgia and backwards looking. And certainly you can hear in the tracks on this album and on Arthur as well, they both are sort of... Um, very much reminiscing about a time that has passed in a way that is a longing for that time. Um, it's a concept album in the sense that all of these songs are designed to be vignettes about English life, uh, and it was recorded um, over the course of uh, one and a half years as well after something else was done. Um, and once again, it's important to note that a big piece of the Kink story is the fact that they could not tour in America for the bulk of uh, the 60s. And as a result, um, many people, and, and they themselves, attribute that to the definitive Englishness of their tracks. Um, this was a flop upon being released in the United States. It basically flew totally under the radar. It wasn't even all that popular in the UK commercially. Um, it didn't hit gold status in the UK, believe it or not, until 2018. Um, but it was immediately beloved by critics, um, pretty much universal. And that has been something that has continued to be the case for this album. It is also an album that is deeply beloved by musicians, including the Kinks contemporaries of the time, Pete Townsend, the Beatles, all kinds of people that sing the praises of this album uh, consistently. Um, it also is looked at as a template in many ways for the Brit pop that would come later. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever heard a Blur album, <laughs> like yeah. I, I posted a clip earlier um, this week of different artists from, you know, XTC and the Pogues and uh, Natalie Merchant from 10,000 Maniacs and different people, Noel Gallagher from Oasis. And there's people talking about how much they love this album. Um, uh, uh, Madness, another band that mm. was quite a bit to, to the kinks in terms of this. Um, but uh, uh, Noel Gallagher made a 
snarky comment if you're familiar with Oasis and Blur, but he's not necessarily wrong, uh, where he said that he didn't think David, <laughs> Damon Halburn would have a career if it wasn't for Ray Davies in this album, which is kind of funny, but also kind of true, because <laughs> it certainly uh, is a clear um, uh, reference point for like Park Life by Blur, if you've heard that album, so... Um, so this album starts with the song Village Green, which Ray Davies wrote as part of the Something Else recording time. Uh, it was not put on that because he sort of at that point decided that he wanted to kind of do a thematic album around the concept of a village green. And the village green was an idealized, protected place of retreat that was sort of an English... It was an English, decidedly English place with English sensibilities, but it didn't actually exist. Davies sort of said it was like an idealized place. Think like Disney World, but more of like a quaint, rural, slash suburban English version. And he really kind of continues that concept into Arthur, um, just putting it in a post-World War II context. So it can kind of be looked at as crafting the the, the setting for... Um, the, the next two albums, this one and, and Arthur after it. Um, so they're often looked at as companion pieces. Um, Davies, it's all like consistently mentioned that he's a perfectionist on his best day. And he was particularly neurotic um, and perfectionistic in this album. And some people speculate that he was actually hesitant to finish this album because the creation of it was sort of a way that he was sort of working through his burnout and disconnection because he really loved the theme of this album. Um, some some pretty famous CTS standbys are on this as well. Um, you may remember the name Nicky Hopkins uh, from The Who and the Rolling Stones uh, albums, or maybe I do because I covered both of those, but Nicky Hopkins plays the strings and the woodwinds on this as well as the Mellotron on this album. Um, and actually, this album caused a lifelong feud between Ray Davies and Nicky Hopkins because Nicky Hopkins claimed that he did 70% of the keyboard work on this album, but Ray Davies credited himself with the majority of the keyboard work, not the minority of it. And apparently that really chapped Nicky Hopkins' ass. Uh, Somebody's because, just flat out lying yeah. in that. You know, you can't, that's not just a little bit really. of a discrepancy. I'll, I'll be honest, I don't really see Ray Davies anywhere refuting it necessarily. So I, there's very... It's very a very specific grudge from Nicky Hopkins, and like I said, there's not really Ray Davies that I've seen rebutting it, so I think there might be some uh, smoke True. to the fire there and what yeah. Nicky Hopkins uh, claimed right there. But I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna cut the bio short there because I, I would. You know, there's a lot of bio in the episodes where we covered Arthur a couple episodes ago that cover what happened after this and where they went and the sort of the renaissance of the kinks. There's a lot in the face the face to face episode about the creation of the kinks and their transition away from sort of the garage rock band. And then the something else episode, we cover the kinks sort of becoming a British band that was a, a story writing band. So let's go right into a review of this album. Um, maybe uh, Josh, let's have you start. what did you think of this one? I love this album. I can't decide if it's my favorite Kinks album. It's probably tied with something else by the Kinks. I feel like every song on here is awesome. And I love listening to it. Just put it on repeat. And what I love about it is is that English setting vibe. I love how I feel like this succeeds as a concept album in the way I want it to. Right? It doesn't stick to a story like the way Tommy does, but it, it creates a feeling and a mood about around a setting in this provincial or pastoral setting of old time England. There's some there's some great tracks on here and they're they're catchy in the same way that something else by the king or tracks on something else by the kinks was for me i found that a couple songs sounded like other songs to me i don't know if that's intentional or not but the opening guitar part of pic picture book sounds like another song but i can't figure out what song it is and then last power last of the steam powered train sounds like a ccr guitar lick to me but hmm. yeah. um i don't know why that is and it's it sounds like green river i think um i, I, I also hear like, a little of that i see yeah. what you're saying i also like the hand claps on that song a lot um it seems like he's not afraid to experiment with with different sounds i feel like you get a little player piano sound and sitting by the riverside and then you get a dark sounding song like wicked annabella which really rocks and then you even get something on like village green the track before wicked annabella with 
which is like a I guess it's like maybe it's the Mellotron or like a harpsichord or a keyboard or something that that yep, sounds different the, har- that sounds That's like def- harpsichord on a har- village green that sounds like harpsichord yeah and it was pl- it was harpsichord played on the Mellotron <laughs> oh oh wow okay, okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. nice and then even even something like the last track people take pictures of each other that is the type of like in comparison to Pink Floyd's nonsense with bike this is like the the fun type of light uh lyrical content that i'm looking for in a in a fun song it's it's a very bouncy like song that you in fact i was dancing to it in the morning when i first woke up because it was so good so yeah I, i i can't even think i don't think there's any weak songs on this album big sky is great animal farm's great maybe starstruck or phenomenal cat i can't remember i have to go back and listen but uh, all around i really appreciate the variety and just the testament to them crafting really great pop songs high recommend for me so i um i have an interesting kind of history with this album i remember my brother got it um was really getting into it some got a while ago probably sometime around oh four oh three oh four oh five somewhere around there and uh, it's, it's the time I was kind of living near him, so he would he would play a lot. He's like, you got to listen to this. It's so great, blah, blah. And I just wasn't feeling it. And I was kind of like, I, I always remember liking the opening track, the Village Green Preservation Society, liking that. And then, you know, he would kind of have it playing in the background. And I was just like, eh, whatever, you know, I just so and I never really listened to it again until um, till this past week. And um I'm so glad I did because <laughs> I I loved it too, and I was yeah. kind of like what, just kind of trying to remember what I what was going on with me back then that I just really what what turned me off about it because it's not like I remember, it's not like a lot of songs listening to it this week I remember hearing and going oh I remember not liking that song because of X Y or Z it's, it was almost like listening to it again like I had forgotten it so much, um, but I agree I I think. I would say Josh too. I can't decide if this is my favorite album or actually Arthur. I would probably throw that oh, in there because I, okay. I really liked Arthur. I, I liked I liked the these are the my two favorites. Um, I, I like something else, but I just like these two better. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, there's some really catchy stuff in here. I think Picture Book is has been stuck in my head every day, <laughs> yeah. and like I'll be singing that. She's like, "You were singing that yesterday morning." I was like, "I know. I can't freaking get it out of my head." <laughs> Um, I, I agree too that the lyrics make me laugh, you know, like, you know, the, the, why we take like, yeah, there's yeah. people take pictures <laughs> of each other just to prove that they really existed, you know, like, that's, that's pretty funny. Um, and, uh, but yes, there's some, there's some darker sounding songs in here. I really liked Village Green. I really liked um, Last of the Steam Power Trains too. That was yeah. a very, that's got a great groove. Um, Johnny Thunder's great. This is, this is a very solid album. I can see it in, in, and I, uh, the Britishness is certainly there. And I think one of the interesting things I'm picking up with on the kinks is, you know, sometimes you listen to a band, you know, they're British, but you can't tell that they're British when they mm. sing. You can't tell yeah. it like you can tell Ray yeah. Davies is a British <laughs> dude when you listen to him sing, you know, because yeah. his accent is just the, the way that he sings, the way that it's produced. It's it's very, very noticeable. But um, but I would say that that's really what drew me in it. You, you're right, Josh. The British feeling is certainly here. But I just this is just musically like a, a really, really solid album. Um, mm. And it probably for a lot of people that don't like longer tracks, you know, um, that like what Arthur had because arthur had some some fairly long tracks some jam out stuff you don't really have that here this is more straightforward uh what the longest song on here is just over four minutes i think um yeah a lot, lot of songs um but it's still only a 40 minute album um so yeah this is a um this is a great listen and i think i'm also hearing it's interesting you're talking about um what is it brit pop john or 90s rock because i felt like there's certainly you could you could hear the precursor to like alt rock like 90s alt rock at the like at the end of wicked annabella that just seems like a very you know the, they do a mm-hmm. quick little jam thing there and that to me i'm like that seems like a 90s i wouldn't say grunge but kind of like definitely a 90s alt rock kind of uh kind of sound that they're going for there so in, in that sense it's a little um you know ahead of its time but uh just great fun album you know great catchy melodies a uh, lot of in- cool instrumentation musicianship um funny lyrics uh great album i i really like this and i'm, I'm gonna miss covering the kinks this is the last kinks album that we're doing oh, we're not really? doing lola like i wish we were doing lola um but uh but like that muswell hillbillies i think that's another one that's supposed to be really good so i might have to do some more delving into the kinks because uh this has been it's been really fun getting to uh to listen to them nice 
Yeah, I um, it's funny because I'm not a greatest hits guy. I know Matt has mentioned many times that his exposure to a lot of '60s bands is through greatest hits um, collections, and yep. I think the Kinks is the rare exception where I was more familiar with them as a greatest hits band than as an album band, which is unusual for me. Um, and so as we were covering the Kinks album, I've always identified myself as a big fan of the band. And we would get into some of the albums and we'd get some of the tracks that I loved, like Waterloo Sunset and, uh, you know, um, just for songs along the way. And uh, I kept waiting for for the album that was going to co- be as coherent as like the greatest hits that I loved. Mm-hmm. And I started to think, well, maybe just it was because a lot of their greatest hits were singles because when I think of great King songs like Autumn Almanac and Dedicated Follower of Fashion and stuff like that, they're, they're, none of them are on the albums, right? Mm-hmm, so it's like, yeah. hmm, well, maybe they're, um, maybe just a lot of the King songs that I love are singles and they spread the rest of them out, you know, over the different uh, Sunny Afternoon, right, was on, was Sunny Afternoon, was it on something else, right? Face and to Waterloo Face. Sun- face to Face, okay, and then, yeah, Waterloo Sunset was on um, something else. Something else. Yeah. And so I, I figured, okay, well, maybe they just spread them out, and then the rest of the singles. This album didn't have any singles, right, in terms of, like, mm-hmm. their greatest hits. The only one that I think was ever on, one that I ever listened to, was... Picture book? No, picture book, which makes sense when you hear. I can't believe that wasn't a single. You know, Matt test you know, is a testament to how that can get stuck in your in your head in a good way. But this was the one. I'm like, here we go. This is the album that solidified to me, okay, yep, this is the kinks that I remember because this is them firing on all cylinders. Um it's not as inconsistent as face to face was. Um I, I really liked something else, but I think this was a step up in terms of the crafting of the songs as a consistent unit. Uh and I, I definitely think this was not as indulgent as Arthur was. I feel like um it, it reigned in it had reigned in tendencies, which really helped it. Um I, I thought the this was a very ambitious album musically um, with all of the, the strings at different times. I know that I mentioned the woodwinds earlier, but you can hear them quite a bit. But at no point do they overpower um, the song structure and the song craft. There's just a lot of really good hooks on this album. There's a lot of good wordplay. There's humor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my God, like you, <laughs> you hear this album and like off the top of my head, I'm just laughing. I'm thinking to myself, okay. How many songs can I think of that were directly influenced by this album? Okay, Tuesday Morning by the Pogues, you know, like, with your eyes, you know, like, immediately you could hear it, right? Our House by Madness, I'm like, you know, or It Must Be Love by Madness, those are songs that are, like, ripped directly out of this. Blurs, almost their entire thing. (laughs) Pulp, the band Pulp, you know, Common People and stuff, that's, like, right out of this. Um, So I could just keep firing off you know, British bands that, and when Matt said, you know, you know, a lot of British bands that don't sound British. Well, there's this other subsect of, you know, British bands that sound really fucking British. Like yeah. that's who this album influenced, like yeah. all of the soul. And like, you can see how that the Britishness of singing and the songs were clearly influenced by this album. And on that sense, I'm going to make a bold comment here, Matt. While the larger Mm. influence of the Beatles is seen on more music, I think that for bands that are quintessentially British, this is the Sgt. Pepper for them of albums. Because to me, it created the whole genre that would be British rock written about British themes. Um, mm-hmm. Because it just is so clearly the for the forerunner yeah. to that type of music, mm-hmm. and so um, and that's a good thing because a lot of that music that came later is fantastic. Um, and so I don't all those songs I mentioned that I love, by the way, or that I mentioned are songs that I love. So um, that's a huge compliment. But yeah, high recommend for me. I, by far, I think this is the best Kinks album we've done, and I, I liked something else quite a bit, and I actually liked Face to Face quite a bit. Um, but to me. This is this is a, a large step up from that. Um, it is definitely, in my opinion, the '60s. It's their masterwork. Um, I like some of their stuff in the '70s quite a bit, um, but it, this stands far and away above as the as my favorite song. And uh, you know, Ray Davies is a hell of a freaking songwriter. And yeah. that, I mean, that's another thing that really comes out. So, yeah. so John, is this consider? Would you consider this like the peak? the peak kinks or the at least like the highlight the highest part peak of their i I mean they had so see the thing with the kinks is they wrote a lot of great songs so it kind of comes down to like 
does it have the the absolute best songs the Kinks had? No, like I mean, but you know my take on Waterloo yeah. Sunset and you know Sunny Afternoon. I mean, you know, and I mentioned some of the singles before. Uh, you know, you really got me earlier on as a phenomenal song. Yeah. So they were writing like bits of brilliance, but they spread it out. Right. This is the most condensed album form version of greatness. And yeah. I'm going to throw another reference here. Um, the Kinks to me are very similar to The Cure, a band I really like, but that have spread their hits across a bunch of different albums that sometimes you're like, hmm, you know, what is the what is the, the pinnacle Cure album until you hear Disintegration and you're like, oh, there it is. That's like, that's yeah. the album. That's The Cure, right? Like this yeah. is this is the Kinks, you know, I, I don't want to say it's their Disintegration because it came before, had a uh, way ahead of it, but it's the same basic concept. It's like, okay, start here. This is their masterpiece. And then, you know, pick and choose, you know, multiple songs on a bunch of different albums going forward. And, you know, we'll cover The Cure quite a few times in the 80s when we get there. But I actually think that's another good reference. Um, yeah. Yeah, and there's a, whole, there's a whole part of the Kinks, you know, career in the 60s that we haven't touched, like the early Kinks, which yeah, is, right. very, you know, I feel like, I mean, certainly I, you can see the progression of where they go um, with from face to face all the way through Arthur, because I think that they were all subsequent albums, right? They were the four the four albums mm -hmm. that we covered were all we didn't. There was nothing in the middle of any of those that we didn't cover. Um, can and, I just point uh, out, by the way, that those yeah. two albums include songs like "You Really Got Me" and "Where of All the Good Times Gone," exactly. like total stud tracks. All <laughs> like, day you know, and all so, the night. Yeah, no. Yeah. The, yeah all day and the all stuff, the night. Exactly. Yep. That's mm -hmm. the stuff that you, that's the stuff that I was most familiar with, right? So before right. even coming into this podcast, that's you know that is what I was really familiar with. So um, so that's why even I even I even appreciate what we've done even more so because um, this was stuff that I really wasn't for the most part knew a couple of songs here and there, but for the most part, this was all brand new for me. And um, yeah, this is cool too, because I, I, I was just thinking like, you even got a little bit of the, uh, the, the prog, you still got a, you're right, John, this is certainly a much more straightforward album. It's less self-indulgent um, over the top for, compared to Arthur, but you still like in a song, like all of my friends were there. There's still a little bit of a proggy kind of thing. It's a short song, but there's like two separate parts to it, you know? And it's like, you got the verses and all of a sudden the chorus goes in this totally different direction. And the, and the, the time signature changes and the tempo changes. And it's like a whole, and it's just a great, it's, it's just a great structure of, um, a song structure mm -hmm. and uh it just the whole album just keeps you interested you know it's just it's 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 got a theme yes it, there's some similarities but there's so much different things going on that um it, it becomes its own thing and it's it's yeah it's a really they're a really interesting band um and this is a very fun listen well, I think it helps too, <laughs> is that like all of their songs are like two and a half minutes so mm -hmm. it's just like incredibly like concise earworms basically every song on this album yeah and that's probably what i would say is like i could see why john this is way better for you than arthur was um i i still i don't mind what they did in arthur and i, I liked a lot of what they did there but if you're looking at an overall like recommendation like for the masses if you will like this would probably be that because that's what they did in arthur is something that can be yeah. I think I could see why people really love it. I know I really loved it, but I could also see that's an album. I'm like, yeah, I, that this is going to turn some people off. This album's going to turn fewer people off than Arthur would for sure. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons why they just do a song done. What's the next song? You know, um, and I think that that could be an overall more palatable approach um, for a lot of people. You know, yeah. and it's it's fascinating, too, because a lot of the songs that we haven't covered in those earlier albums, Matt, like Set Me Free and Tired of Waiting for You. And then the singles I talked about that kind of are under the radar, like they um, they lay the foundation for this album, as do some mm -hmm. of the tracks on earlier albums, you know, the singles that we mentioned. So you can kind of see this album coming. And I think that's been one of the cool things about listening to albums before it and then the album after it is you can see, OK, where did this lead to? And then, you know, what led up to it being created? So unlike Dylan, where I think it's jarring to kind of go late Dylan, early Dylan, middle Dylan, mm -hmm. I actually think jumping around with the kinks helps you to kind of understand them a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. Sad. We're not talking. Maybe we need to do kinks albums as bonuses sometime in the set when we hit the 70s. I'd like to keep listening to them. I mean, no, obviously, I can't outside of the you podcast. You can, Josh. I don't yeah, know that's, why I said that. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, but like that's some I def, sort of rule. Yeah, no, this is a band that I've always, you know, I think I might have said this when we first covered them. I've always 
known about. I've always liked the stuff that I've heard, but I never got pushed over the edge to really get into their stuff. And uh, I think I might have just been pushed over the edge to, you know, do some do some more exploring on my own. Because I I do like you said, John, those early that early stuff sounds great. I have listened to Lola a couple times. That's got what's that Eight Man's on that. That's a great yeah, song. Yeah, Eight Man's you know? awesome. <laughs> so um, and I hear that. But like I said, is it Muswell Hillbillies or whatever? That's another '70s mm-hmm. album. I hear that. It's that's a really very good too, album. So, yep. Yeah. So um, I need I need some more Kinks in my life. Gotcha. Well, who knows? Maybe we'll stumble across a bonus episode of them down the road. So, um, but I think.